Ladies and gentlemen, a warm welcome for James Ramirez, please. <laughs> Hi, thank you. Uh, yeah, so my name is James Ramirez. I'm a freelance art director living in Los Angeles. Uh, thank you to Maxon for having me. It's amazing to be here with all these like artists and speakers, and it's it's an amazing community, and I'm glad to be a part of it. Uh, to give a little backstory on me, I just wanted to like give a little history to kind of explain how I got from point A to point B. Uh, I started uh, straight out of school. I got a job at a studio called MK12 in Kansas City, Missouri. Uh, they were some of like the early like motion graphic uh, pioneers, and it was amazing for me to go as a student into their studio and for them to like mentor me and kind of help me kind of understand filmmaking from like an artist centric kind of point of view where they were doing a lot of like self driven and experimental work which then would lead to client work which then would lead to them getting budgets and money to do their own stuff so it was kind of this cool process and I think it definitely instilled in me a sense of like always wanting to experiment and do research and you know design and like uh, constantly playing and, and doing self driven work. Uh, after about almost 10 years there, I uh, moved to Los Angeles and I took a staff uh, art director position at Royale. It was an interesting like transition, like coming out here because it was a, a like in an, at MK12 it was like nine of us creating a lot of things, and out here there was like a bigger team. It was like 26 to 30 people, and the the kind of work was very different. I was doing a lot of like stylized, you know, animation, very motion graphic centric, and this was kind of like more of like a different level of finish, and. Uh, it was, you know, kind of more photoreal and more polished, and uh, the jobs had actual teams. It was amazing to have, like, a team of designers, a team of animators, a team of compositors, a 3D team, and it was cool to have, like, those resources and kind of help push your ideas so that if you were designing something, you kind of had more people to come in and, like, tackle things. And so, but, what it, like, being there, I also learned that, like, that strength of, like, doing experimental work, like, as a, like, designer on projects, I could kind of come in and help kind of find creative direction that would be like, hey, what if we tried to, you know, look at this for reference for how this explodes or how this like transitions. And so with that kind of like knowledge, it was really, you know, like after being somewhere for 10 years, you don't really kind of know everything that you've absorbed from everybody. And so it was kind of refreshing to like learn that all of this was like transferring project to project and just learning more and more each project. And so kind of with that to kind of like uh, give more of like a sense of like the work that I did and kind of the process, I try to cut a new reel where I put a lot of my design and experiments and kind of like those design iterations that lead up to the final project into like a montage and uh, I made this. Thanks. Uh, and then after Royale, I went freelance, and I've been freelance for like uh, about two years. And then I've gotten to work on uh, some amazing projects. But kind of at Royale, the other thing that I was introduced to was like uh, using Cinema 4D as a tool. And it was amazing to me to see kind of like how the designers there were using it early on in the process and also kind of like throughout production, like doing, you know, broadcast spots and web promos and stuff through it. And it was a really powerful tool. And there were some amazing people that I could learn from. Mike Humphrey, Handel Eugene, who has spoke before from Axon. And, uh, Renzo Reyes and they were like big inspirations for me and like motivators to like help me and help and encourage me to like kind of push it and explore more so like throughout my process I've begun to like adapt that and kind of it's, it's kind of changed fundamentally like how I go about making things even if it's like in the earliest uh, phases and so like in my presentation what I kind of wanted to talk about was using like Cinema 4D throughout the process like as an art director I try to be very hands-on and like a part of the process throughout the entire project and so 
I wanted to share some personal work uh, where I was like, you know, playing around with cinema, just trying to get hone in my skills and get better at like, you know, going from like storyboards to a final animation, uh, a pitch on some uh, main on ends for a film that we did not win, but I still wanted to share it because it was a, a fun process. And of course, uh, End of the Spider-Verse, which some of you maybe have seen. Uh, so starting with the uh, personal work, uh, I will play it, um, but I'm going to talk about like using Redshift. I want to learn Redshift, so I just thought it would be best if I just gave myself some self-driven work to uh, pursue and, and learn it. So this is uh, how that turned out. So, side note, thanks to my friend Carlos Trevino, who did the uh, sound design and music for this, and as well as my reel. I very much appreciate that. Uh, so, the project was, like, you know, like I said, it was self-driven. So, I just wanted to say, like, let's, you know, sketch out something. I had a very simple idea. The idea was there was, like, this mysterious uh, landscape on a, you know, desolate planet, and a drone was going around. It finds something to scan, and in that scan, you kind of get this interesting abstract interpretation of what that scan information is, and then you kind of reveal there's a big mysterious planet with lots of them flying around. And so uh, there was a couple of things I wanted to tackle was like, you know, what if I want to make something that isn't like photoreal with Redshift? I just want to make something that's stylized. And also like, I want to create some of these really cool kind of like light projections that are, uh, you know, usually like creating volumetric light in 3D programs is often like hard. And I found with Redshift, it was like amazing. So I just kind of wanted to share that. So if we open switch over here to my scene, uh, this is the scene that I kind of built everything with. It was like, you know, again, it was like a small project, so I could kind of create everything self-contained within one scene. I was using uh, the take system so that I could uh, just switch cameras and turn on and off layers. It, it's a really amazing system that you can use. So I kind of have it broken out for the shots that I kind of finished this, did Cinema 4D for chunks of it, and I finished in After Effects, so I was kind of dividing up those shots. So uh, this is the first shot where we're panning across the surface. We see the light projection. And uh, the second shot, we uh, find the, the boot print. Uh, and there was a separate UI pass. And then third one, I kind of just created a loose uh, representation of this kind of abstract you know, diving into the scan that I kind of did in After Effects. And then for the last shot, we're pulling it back across the uh, planet surface, and then we see all the drones, and I kind of rendered all of those on separate passes. And if I open up Redshift here and turn on the IPR, uh, we can load and see what this looks like. So that's, I, I really liked working with this because it's kind of such a fast visual interaction with what you're doing. Um, if I go to a wide shot, you can kind of see what's happening here. I have like a really small landscape that I've set up. Uh, if I switch over to objects, we can go to my shot 10 and see that uh, my lights as well, shot 10. I have some environment lights that I'm using to illuminate and add a, a lot of co moody color to my uh, scene. I love teal and purple, if it isn't obvious in all of my work. Uh, so. I did that, and I'm using the uh, Redshift environment to create this like atmospheric fog throughout, and the lights are all casting into that. And then we have uh, the drone here in the center of our uh, shot that is kind of um, has a spotlight that is parented to it, so that as we move our drone around, we're able to uh, have that animation move around. Oh, and there is one more slide. If I do from current slide. I made uh, this animation inside After Effects. Just I knew that this light, I kind of wanted doing this kind of like, you know, looping animation. So I kind of created some concentric rings to feed into the light as a as a source. So uh, that is like if we look at the light and we go to our general, it has a texture. And so let's open, let's switch to a scene where this isn't set up. Let me turn this off for a second before I break it. And we can look at the scene. So the same scene. Uh, but it doesn't have all the atmospherics, uh, cool, moody lighting that we were doing. And it still looks interesting. It's kind of this cool, like, low reflective, low poly landscape. Uh, but it definitely doesn't have that same mood. So if we go up to Redshift and add an object, Redshift environment, uh, nothing changes. Uh, now there is a volume that we're going to be contributing to. So if we go over to our spotlight and uh, fight. 
if we go over to our spotlight and we go to volume, we can now start telling Redshift that we want that light to contribute to our volume. And so now we get this like instant, you know, volume cone. And like I feel like in anything else, that it's always been so difficult for me just to get to this stage. So we're like already there in like a couple of steps, right? So if the next thing that I want to do is I want to add that texture to it to kind of affect what the light color is and also uh, what uh, the intensity is. So if we go over to our path, we can go to select, and we're on the desktop, and we're James Ramirez, and we're in 01. Texture, we're going to grab our texture sequence, and immediately now our light has, is taking on those properties of our animation. If we scrub through here, you can kind of see how that's updating and showing that animation. And the other nice thing is that you know you can also play with your uh, light fall off. So if you wanted, if like obviously I wanted this light to hit all of the surface and kind of deform along the, the surface, so you can play with that and and kind of really dictate and shape your light. And you can also go into the general properties of it. Uh, and change, you know, like your cone angle. You can have it like a really wide throw where you can kind of control what your light is doing. And then you can also play with the intensity. Uh, obviously, if you bump this up like a lot more, you get a more uh, vibrant light. But also, if you like bumped it up a real lot, you can see that it starts really contributing to your scene and adding uh, a lot of that kind of like illumination from that light source. So it's, this is looking cool, but uh, we're still missing our environment lights. So we're also going to grab all of our environments and go over to our volume contribution on those. And we're going to set those to 0.1 as well. Now, our scene has gotten really bright. And that's because, you know, like I said, like when you add that redshift environment, you're adding, like it's a big volume and you're on all, all of these lights are contributing to it. And if you turn on a bunch of lights, your volume is now just going to get bright. So how we're going to kind of combat that is you could play with like the intensity on these and kind of dial them in. But, you know, like I said, I, I kind of was positioning them in, and already doing that step. but what we can do is go into attenuation and just affect how much that light falls off. So let's say if we do like 0.1, we can see already we have a drastic result. Like now, I think the light is falling off way too much, but now it definitely, we're still getting those kind of atmospherics of where those lights are placed and getting that moody lighting. And it's just kind of dialing in like where you think uh, how much that should be. Like maybe if I do 0.05, it still allows a lot more of that ambient uh, light contributions, but we're still kind of being able to stay a little mysterious and see more detail in our scene. And so, you know, with this, I kind of went through this process and then using uh, the AOVs in Redshift, you can kind of uh, do different render passes and take that into your compositing software and kind of dial in the look that you're going for. So I kind of was, I, I added reflection and specular, and I wanted the, the light as a separate pass so that I can kind of just have just that and dial that in. Um, and I did that through the uh, render settings and under AOV. There's a uh, AOV manager, and you can come in here and just anything that you really want to add to your scene. If you wanted to add ambient inclusion as a pass, you can just double click that. And then when you render, now like you have an extra pass. So you can kind of come in here and dictate that. And the, the kind of cool thing about this as well is that, you know, with the take system, I was also saving different render settings. So each shot had different render settings, which had different render passes. So it's cool that you can kind of like control that per layer so you're not rendering a bunch of extra things like for every single shot. Um, you know, specifically for some of these, you know, UI shots, I was like uh, turning the environment down and just getting just the volume light so I could have more control over that in comp. Um, so yeah, so that, that's this kind of project and kind of like my kind of learning Redshift and learning how to dial it in and, and it's been a lot of fun. Uh, and then the next project I would like to talk about is this title sequence that I got to pitch on. Uh, I got to pitch on this title sequence at Alma Mater. It was for the movie Venom. We didn't win it. <laughs> you win some, you lose some. And normally I don't really talk about a lot of the work that doesn't, you know, make it out there. but. I thought the creative process on this was interesting enough and the technique was uh, interesting that I wanted to share it. Uh, the creative challenge with this project was that uh, the assignment was given to us to create something for Venom that didn't include anything that was symbiote related, so like organic growing things and also no webbing. So like the character had no relationship to like that property of the comic books and so it was like, how do you create something that's iconically Venom that doesn't have that, those qualities? And so what I chose to focus in on was the idea that this character is constantly, you know, he's like an anti-hero, so it's this constant good and bad evil, you know, kind of like decisions, good and bad, evil good, and, you know, this conflict. And the thing that I tried to hone in on was like, you know, the organic quality to their relationship. And so 
I started looking into like uh, Voronoi patterns, and I thought that the way that it uh, was created substructures was an interesting kind of relationship to that character. And then inside Cinema 4D, there's a Voronoi fracture tool. And so with that, I, I also wanted to make sure that I was creating something that if we went to production, that it, it could be like a procedural system that I could drop in any image and it would update and I could create design frames like as fast as I, I needed to. And so let's take a look at that and see what that looks like. Uh, if I jump back over to cinema, I have a scene called Venomize. So I have a plane that I've dropped into a Voronoi fracture and uh, I'm using kind of like the iconic uh, eyes as a texture and it is affecting like the pattern. So what's cool about this is that I kind of have this like really nice density towards the center where it feels like there's a lot of fragments and towards the edges it kind of gets some uh, bigger and it kind of feels like you're kind of focusing the eyes towards the center while you're looking at this composition. So I'm gonna open up a new scene and I guess I should say that, you know, it's just using like to, since it's a MoGraph, you can use effectors on it, and I'm just using a random and shader effector to kind of drive this effect. So I'm going to look at it in a new scene so we can just kind of walk through what that looks like. So here's the same thing. I was working at a uh, 2048 by 858 aspect ratio, so I created my plane at that size. And then let me switch so we can keep that. Uh, switch garage shading with lines. And then uh, that's my frame. That's the scene. And then I'm going to create a MoGraph Veroni fracture. I'm going to drag my frame into there, and instantly we kind of get some feedback of what's happening. So if we look at the uh, object, it's uh, by default, it's colorizing the fragments just so you can see what information it's doing. Uh, I don't need that. We're going to you know, do our own thing, so let's turn that off. But if we go to sources, you can see that it's automatically added a point generator, and it's distributing that evenly across the surface uh, through uniform. So we could increase this, and we would get more fragments. Uh, the, since, again, like I was trying to control that density and keep it more central, uh, I found that if you switch this to normal, it uh, is looking towards the center of your object, and the, the plane in this case, and it's concentrating that, and it's leaving all of the bigger fragments outside the, along the edge. And so you could also do inverse normal if you needed to do that, where it's kind of doing the opposite. And then there's also this deviation where you can control like how you know, wide or concentrated that is. So it's fun. I like the default value, and I'm going to keep it at normal. And then, so the next step is like, okay, how do we start making this look like, you know, the image that we want? Well, since it was all like texture based, we're going to add a shader node. And on that shader node, we're going to add our texture. So it's, we're going to go to our image. We're going to go up here. And so at the time, like I didn't really have anything to use. It was just a trailer. So I went and did a bunch of screen grabs from the trailer. And uh, we'll, just grab, we'll just grab this uh, screaming version of him. Nothing has changed. But if we go down here to the sample mode, we can see that uh, it's set to volume. We're going to set it to surface. And we're going to turn off this other point generator for now, just so we can see what, exactly what it's doing. So now we're starting to see that it's starting to do something, but it definitely doesn't look like our image. So maybe if we just increase our amount, let's say like 3,500, we'll just throw a lot of fragments at it. You can start to see that the image values, the black and whites, are starting to dictate how that object is getting fragmented. But as you can see in this case, we were trying to stay away from webs. and uh, this looks like webs. <laughs> so that's not a good thing. So uh, that's kind of why I ended up keeping up this initial point distribution on, because it helped break up those negative spaces where my image was black. And so I just wanted to make sure that there was something out there. So you know, you could play with this and kind of figure out like, oh, well, most of those fragments are on the outside. So you can kind of play with that scale and figure out where it's going to work best for you. So this is looking interesting. It still isn't exactly what we were looking for. And also, there's kind of like a little bit of a, a weirdness to how it's creating those fragments. So we can also look, go into our shader and affect the uh, sample precision. So if we increase this to, I don't know, maybe like 60. And I'm going to lower this just so we can make sure that we're fast, because it is a lot of fragments. Uh, that that kind of gets rid of a little bit of those like uh, straight lines that were occurring. And then we can start getting this uh, more organic effect that we're looking for. Now, the next thing that we want to do is add an effector. We're going to do a random. Obviously, that is not what we want. As by default, it's affecting the position. We're going to turn that off. But we do want it to affect the scale. And what I want is like to, have to create some gaps between all of these different fragments. So I'm going to turn on uniform, absolute, and I'm going to do a negative 0.1 
and that introduces us some nice like breakup amongst the surface so that we're seeing, I put a uh, plane underneath it that's just straight black so that whenever we see through those fragments, we're seeing kind of that contrast in color, which you know I knew going in that this was gonna be black and white. So you could create a nice like black composition and maybe your, your floor plane is white and still retaining that contrast. So this is kind of looking close, it's getting better. We wanna make sure that we also turn on index so that it gives a bit more variety. You could play with the seed if you weren't happy with it until you find something you like. And now the next step that you know I would like to do is maybe let's add a shader effector to it to get some of that kind of cool uh, shading that we're doing. Again, that's not what we want to do. It's affecting the scale, but we're going to leave it alone for right now. So under shading, again, we could go over to our fracture object in that shader and copy that same one. And we can go to our shader, and we can paste. And now we have that same texture, and it's looking at the black and white values, and it's starting to affect the gradation and color of our object because underneath the effector parameters, we have it set to affect the color mode is turned on. This is cool, but we don't actually want it uh, affecting a positive scale. We want to do absolute uniform. Actually, if we set this to negative one, we start to get something that starts to look like our design frames. Now it's taking all of the white values and scaling all the fragments that are in those areas and making them negative so they're going to zero and everything that's black is uh, staying at its current scale. So it's kind of cool, but that's not exactly what we want. We almost want the inverse of that. So what I'm going to do is go back to our shading and I'm going to apply a filter. Well, there's two ways you can do this, but I, I like doing it through a filter because it has a bit more control. But we can go to filter. And down here at the bottom, we have these gradation curves. So if I enable this, what's nice is right now, this is our black point and this is our white point. It's going zero to one. If we affect this and basically invert it, you can see that it has a dramatic effect on our look. And now, you know, we've kind of taken those values and we're, now we're able to control them more clearly and kind of have a, a more distinct look and kind of dial in where we want those fragments and how we want them. So this is, you know, this is pretty cool. This is kind of what I was looking for. But like I said, the other step to this was that I wanted it to be procedural. So if I had another design frame that I needed to make right after this, I need to be able to go here, click this, and load a different image. So let's load the logo. Where did we go? <laughs> let's go back to my folder. And let's say we're going to grab the logo. So now we have a logo, but we've only dropped it into one of our places. It gives a really interesting look on its own. But again, we're going to go up and we're going to copy that, and we're going to apply that to our shader effector as well. So we're going to go inside our filter and paste, and then now it's taking those black and white values and it's creating something that feels like, you know, this is pretty art directable. We can go in there and change the fragments, and I feel like this is just like the tip of the iceberg, but I think it's kind of cool. You could have animated textures. You could have, you know, different effectors that are affecting the rotation, the scale. The, you could have fall off as you're moving through it. I feel like this is a lot of potential. I thought it was a cool idea, and I just kind of wanted to share it. And then, you know, by using a couple of different paths of this, I was able to composite it and create the design frames that I did. And that's that. And then the next project that I wanted to share is the uh, main on ends for Into the Spider-Verse. Uh, I had the pleasure of uh, freelancing at Alma Mater and working with uh, the creative director, Brian Mall, on uh, co-directing the sequence with him. And it was uh, a huge challenge because the film is such a visually stunning, amazing piece, and like, how do you follow up something like that? So uh, for those who haven't seen it, I'll play a little bit of it. So the two things that I kind of wanted to talk about, like we did Cinema 4D throughout the process. We basically did all of our 3D inside of cinema, and then we were doing stereoscopic, so we were rendering left and right eye, which was its own challenge, and then we were finishing in After Effects. We did all of our compositing in After Effects with our lead compositor, Renzo Reyes, uh, who really helped bring all of these things together and shine. So uh, what I wanted to talk about was like partly technique, like how we were doing like a lot of this intro sequence where we're going through run cycles and stuff. And then also the aesthetic of it, like how do you take the uh, comic book vernacular and deconstruct that and create something that feels kind of original and unique. And even after you've been visually assaulted from the film, like you want to give something that feels like people still want to stay around and watch, which is always a challenge, right? So uh, that's this. Let's dive in and take a look at it. So uh, technique-wise, you know, there was... Um, a big part of this was that, you know, in collaboration with the filmmakers, Sony was being really awesome with us and was giving us access to anything that we wanted from the movie. So I would go through the movie and watch shots and say, yeah, I want that Miles and I want that, you know, Ham doing whatever. And it was amazing that they were supplying us, you know, Olympic files of these characters. And then we would just kind of uh, break them apart into 
you know, this kind of zoetrope or um, kind of flip book animation style. And, you know, like looking at, you know, Moybridge's, you know, study of motion, you know, there was a lot of like, you know, you're taking a single action and breaking it apart. So a trope, same thing where you're spinning something around and you're creating the illusion of movement through a, a series of static frames. And also looking at the comic book source, there was a lot of instances where in panels where they'll have, uh, you know, like here, Miles is swinging, but we see three instances of, instances of him in a single frame. It's not, it's not like they're saying that there's three Miles in that frame, but through that technique, they're showing us that he swung and there's a sense of motion. And so, and on the bottom right is kind of like uh, me taking one of uh, Sony's animations of Miles running and jumping and flipping, and then kind of like taking every second or fourth frame and breaking that apart into static, uh, you know, objects. And so if we look at that, uh, once we were kind of figured out like, okay, this is the technique we want to do and we think this is going to work for, you know, the majority of the sequence, uh, back to my exploration and experimentation and R&D, you know, I was kind of set to start exploring like how, how we would do this. So uh, this is kind of like one of my first motion tests of like, could this possibly work? You know, could we do this? So I'm going to play this. I am also going to mute it. But you can see that what I've done is take a simple, I took one of the characters and I just applied a Mixamo animation. So it's really crappy looking, but the idea is just to sell through, you know, just to sell this idea through. So we have multiple colors to represent that each character would be changing. And the, the idea was that all of these characters are, even though they're in different uh, dimensions, uh, they are all connected because they're all Spider-Man or Spider-Women and they're all doing the same things. They all swing, they all jump, they all fight. They, so the idea was like connecting them through their actions and kind of celebrating the amazing animation that the team was doing. So, uh, and how that kind of translated from that was, uh, here is the first shot in the film sequence that we did, where we introduced Miles running alongside the top side of a train. And we get close to him, kind of get that strobing effect, and then we kind of pull back. And this was kind of like the speed lines that we were doing. And then the final shot, which we just watched, but just watch it again, just to see how that came together from 3D to comp and created a more stylized look. So if we open up this shot, I'm going to jump over here and look at it. Uh, so in looking at this, like, you know, the, again, so I'm going to go to the bottom here and just grab, there's this uh, group of miles down here. So I'm going to grab that and paste that into new scene so we can just look at that. We're going to ignore that. We don't care about textures. And you can see that if I turn, if I go back to my cloner object and I actually hide all this and turn it off, and zoom out to where he is. You can see that there was a Miles run sequence where if you saw the film, there was like this kind of intro that each character got was like one more time. And they would kind of explain their origin. And so I, I noticed that throughout the film that they were all using a similar run sequence, even though it was far away. But it definitely looked like I could, it was something I could grab enough frames from to kind of create a fake cycle. So I went through and, you know, same thing. I brought in this Alembic that had the full animation and I, I broke it down to just have like, you know, two or fourth frames enough to where I thought that it would work. This is five and I'm kind of cheating it because it's not really a run cycle. He's just putting his left foot down and then as he goes to take the next step, it just kind of cycles back around. But as you saw in the shot, it happens so fast that it doesn't really register. So, but what I'm doing is I, I ordered them inside this cloner and then the cloner is set to iterate. Let me turn off this uh, rotation. The uh, cloner is set to iterate and it's just set a set distance. So that was kind of the trick is like, if you want to do this kind of strobing effect to make it feel like you're tricking the brain into this illusion that it's actually animating, it's like figuring out what that distance is, the speed, the, the kind of the choreography between what the camera is doing and moving and how these characters are popping on. So I did that and then uh, using a plane effector, you know, this is, this is a lot of them running. <laughs> Over here, there's a plane effector. And the plane effector is uh, telling him to scale to negative one. And I'm using a, fall a linear fall off so that I could just kind of animate where that is. And it's literally just kind of turning them on and off as I needed. So if we go over to the camera shot, back to the one that we took this from, and you kind of look at this, you can see that as we're moving forward to the shot, we kind of start to see him and he's small. And then I'm just animating that cloner forward to kind of start turning on all of these clones. And then as we start to get parallel with him, your mind is kind of just tricking you into that that is moving, kind of taking that kind of zoetrope effect where you're just kind of flashing so fast. And by him kind of staying central in the frame kind of helps create that illusion. And so, uh, yeah, so that's kind of like how we were creating this, uh, this kind of style of motion that we ended up doing kind of throughout like almost the first, you know, minute, minute and a half of the sequence. And again, like 
because we had these like amazing animations from the Sony team, like it was cool to figure out like what characters we could use and how. And also the trouble with this is like being naive and not being a character animator, I didn't realize how proprietary this animation was. So all these characters were animated to frame and for the camera. So say if you had a heroic Miles punching at you, you're like, oh, great, I'm just going to take the camera and rotate around that. Well, you, what you realize is that they were exaggerating all the proportions extremely. So maybe his back feet are really like super squashed down and his head is really big and his hand is really big because comic proportions are a lie. If you're looking at a panel, they're not really drawn like their anatomical figure drawing. They're just made to look, make a cool frame. So it was definitely a hard lesson in like figuring out what stuff we could take and what kind of moves we could do and w what that camera move, you know, what that choreography could, could work and what, where it would break. And so uh, the second uh, thing that I kind of wanted to talk about was, you know, this is what we we're doing, like kind of popping on these characters for most of the piece, but a lot of it is also about this aesthetic. So if we go back to our presentation uh, and look at the aesthetic. so. Again, the challenge was how do you create something that feels really interesting? So throughout the film, they had these cards that they called burst cards that their artists were making. So it was like two to, fra two to four frames uh, for a really quick moment, an action would stop and pop to this very stylized look. And they loved it. They thought it was great. And they're like, how could we kind of explore the, the whole like, title sequence? Like, is this, is this something that we could explore for the title sequence? And we're like, well, you're just doing it for like two or four frames, which makes it really easy because you're basically just doing an illustration, but we have to like carry that through, you know, like three minutes. And so it was kind of just like, you know, deducing down like, what is it that they like? Okay, there's really bold colors. It really treats things like it's a, you know, almost like a, a printing format where it's a really limited palette. There's, you know, slight offset and registration, you know, from the, the layers. There's a lot of uh, that bold texture coming from the comic book print world. There's half tones. You know, there's uh, speed lines. There's there's a lot of uh, elements to help with that kind of tangible quality to what makes it kind of break down, uh, and kind of like the power of the silhouette, where you see like Miles is almost like completely just you know two colors, and so with that, uh, I also kind of went through the film and was taking screen grabs throughout. You know, as you know, we we're just watching kind of rough cuts and stuff as we're progressing. So as they're progressing, I'm trying to look at what they're doing to pull from and trying to pull color palettes from the film that could relate to you know, each of the characters so that if we were to have different vignettes throughout the film or throughout our sequence, you know, it could relate back to the film and it felt like you were you know, used to these colors. And so after doing that, we then started to create these design frames. Uh, Brian Ma really uh, killed it with these on the left side. So left side is our design frames and the right side is, our, is from the final sequence. Um, I think what he really nailed was like, again, that distilled factor of like, bringing in some of that texture. So you have like kind of the spray paint grit texture across everything that was kind of relating to Miles' character because he was like into graffiti and that was a very important part of him. So uh, bringing that into uh, the sequence and making sure that that was very much a part of not just, you know, his sections, but also like everything. You wanted, to, you wanted that to fill across all of the characters. And then the limited palette, again, so you can see like here, he has uh, Spider-Man in the top frames limited down to just like three colors. It's black, white, and red. And then even Miles has been reduced down except for, of course, his uh, dope kicks. And then even in the bottom frame, uh, again, with Spider-Man, we've even removed like his symbol from his chest. And you can see that on the right side where it's just trying to keep this as minimal as possible, but also introducing you know, some outlines so that it kind of feels like hand-drawn. All of the edges have been roughed up so that it doesn't really feel perfect. It has that kind of you know, quality to it. And then, you know, also, again, that, those bright, vibrant colors. And then, you know, towards the end of the sequence, we were really trying to embody, like, what it would be. Like, if you've just introduced the multiverse, what does that mean if you're going to, like, explore this world full of all of these characters and, and full of all of this stuff? So um, that, that was kind of, like, a, an interesting challenge to figure out that, you know, definitely, like I said, Renzo Reyes really helped us in comp, like, you know, figure that out. And so... Uh, what I wanted to do was look at, you know, how we kind of took uh, the approach with some of that inside of cinema. Uh, so this scene has it, but I would like to open up the, the scene that I would like to open is, uh, if we go back to the slide, is this bottom frame from the very uh, last shot of the sequence. Uh, we basically were using the take system to apply a bunch of different textures. We scanned in some paper textures and we had some halftone patterns that we created. And the idea was like if we could apply all of that through takes and uh, apply that to all of these different render passes, we could then bring that back into compositing and kind of make something that felt more handmade. 
So I'm going to close this one out. And this. And go to shot. So this is the last shot of the sequence, um, where we have this tunnel that we're kind of falling through, diving through. And we're kind of clipping through the characters. And we end on Miles. And then we cut to the logo. So the scene doesn't look that glamorous, and it doesn't look like very interesting. But again, like you know, the idea was like if we create all these passes. So if we start looking at what some of these takes are doing, I'm gonna turn off auto take. Uh, if we look at you know the lines, so we took all of the edges uh, from this uh, tunnel and converted those to uh, splines, and then created sweeps so that we could you know create almost like webbing, because in this case we were interested in webbing, like creating webbing that could kind of reflect uh, in this tunnel and. Uh, create some like interesting patterns and uh, line work to add kind of into the mix. So you can kind of see what that looks like. Uh, again, it's kind of reflecting, so you're kind of creating this kind of cacophony of imagery and it's kind of uh, overlapping itself. And this also kind of called back to how they were representing the multiverse in the film, which was like this literal spider web of dimensions as they were kind of uh, jumping in and out. So that looks really cool. We would do like a uh, Fresnel pass so that uh, you were just kind of getting the edges of all these surfaces. So as the surfaces are bending away from camera, you're getting different gradation. Uh, we would put, you know, like procedural noises. And again, it was just like throwing all this stuff against the wall just to see like what would, you know, create interesting uh, visuals. So this was a being, this is, I'm showing this on the environment, but this was also applied to all of the characters as well. So if you look at all of these passes, this is just for the environment. We were doing that per character and per object or whatever we needed. So it got really deep really fast. But again, with the take system, what's also good about it is if you're doing renders, uh, you can uh, add tags so that it is adding like your project name and your take and then your project and take so that you can uh, create these like structured, uh, detailed places of where, where your renders are going. You know what file it came from. You know what layer it came from. And you can go back in and adjust it. And then also, again, like, you know, like I said, with the uh, render settings, we were also using different rendering settings. If we were doing something that was really reflective, we would you know, change that out to make sure we could get it done. Um, so yeah, the take system was definitely very integral to what we were doing, because it made it so that we could have one master file that we could kind of apply all these different things to. So uh, just to keep going through this, we have you know, uh, some more. There was some balls that Rendo, <laughs> Renzo made that were like kind of trying to pay homage to like the Kirby dots that were so uh, um, important to like his aesthetic. So if we render this, you can see that there's just these uh, colored balls, RGB colors, so that we could uh, color them in, in uh, comp, reflecting throughout our tunnel. And then, you know, again, so there's some of the stuff. And then kind of the key thing that I kind of wanted to talk about was this idea of how we treated the environment. So, OK, so the characters are very straightforward. You're creating all these render passes. You're just going to apply it to the characters and composite it. But what about the environment? Again, this is supposed to be exploring the multiverse. So how do you kind of like, uh, like bring that into conceptually into your compositing? So I kind of came with this idea that was like, well, what if each facet of this you know, facade in the end was just actually treated as a mat and a window so that where there's blue, maybe you're looking into Miles' world where it's red. Maybe you're looking into Ham's world where it's green. You're looking into another character's world. And we kind of created different variations of this so that we could kind of have you know, multiple passes of that to then comp and use as different RGB mats. Uh, and it was, it was um, it's pretty interesting to figure out. It's like pretty straightforward, but it then lended us a lot of like uh, leeway and compositing where it also made, you weren't just getting like a beauty pass and that was it, but then now you were getting this kind of cool pass and you were able to play and like, I don't know, what does it look like if there's speed lines? Because yes, there was also speed lines that we were rendering and reflecting as well. I was like, what if that pass just has speed, that color has speed lines? And what if this one has like cut character reflection? So it was a fun process of kind of just like getting to uh, have that creative control in, in, in the project in the end. So uh, if I make a new scene real quick, we can look at how I made that tunnel and how I did that. So if I create it inside, I just want three because we're going to make this kind of uh, twisting tunnel. So I'm going to move this forward, duplicate this, and scale it up a little bit maybe give it a little bit of rotation. And then again, duplicate it, move it back in Z if I can. And let's rotate and scale that up as well. And then what we're trying to do is just create that kind of like twisting tunnel effect. So I'm going to create a loft. 
And we're going to go back to our object manager and grab these three things, drag them into our loft. And now we kind of have like a shape that we're looking at for our tunnel that we're diving in. So I'm going to turn on garage shading and lines so that we can see the, the, how much subdivision this object has. I think it's really high. Again, since we're trying to have these facets each be a, a window, that we don't really need it that much resolution. So we're going to drop this down to maybe like 10 and 4, and that gets us something that's looking better. So I'm going to press C and convert that down to an editable object. And I'm going to delete the caps because, again, we want a tunnel. So we want to be able to look through this and move down it. So cool. This is looking great. It's kind of getting us uh, halfway there. So the next step is that I want to go to my mesh. And I want to do triangulate because uh, what we found is when we were doing reflections based on your surface is also going to dictate how those reflections are, are happening across that surface. And so what I found is if you had really hard edges, it would create more like um, you know, the, the reflections would break more, so they weren't like a really smooth rolling reflection, which we didn't want. We wanted it very stylized and controlled. So by triangulating it, that, that kind of helps. And then the last step is, if we select all of the uh, faces, we do command disconnect and click this little gear and uncheck preserve groups. Basically what we're telling Cinema is that we want all of those faces to be treated as like individual objects amongst this object. And we're also going to delete the Fong tag because, again, we want these hard edges. So now we have our setup. It's looking pretty good, but uh, what do we do now? So now we're going to go to Mode Graph Fracture. We're going to drag our Fracture op object into there, and we're going to change the mode from straight to explode segments. Now, since we just uh, disconnected all the faces, and what that's doing is saying, if this isn't one object, this is a bunch of objects in one. And then, cool, so this is starting to look good. And now, since that is a Mode Graph object, we can go back and add in a random effector. And again, we don't want it to affect the, pr the position, so we're going to turn that off. But we do want it to affect the color. And immediately, we kind of start getting this interesting look. So the other thing we want to do is make sure that we turn on index so that it's thinking of each, uh, again, each face as, as each, each face is, a, is getting treated differently instead of just holistically as an object. So this is looking good, but it's not exactly what we wanted. So we're going to create a shader and apply that to our object. And then we're going to go to our object or our material settings. And since this is an RGB pass, we're just going to do luminance. So we're going to disable everything else, go to luminance, and we're going to add in a MoGraph multi-shader. And if we go inside here, this is where we're going to say, OK, we want to RG and B applied randomly throughout this. So we're going to add one more, because it already has two. And we're just going to make sure these are set to color. And then we're going to go into here and then change these colors. We're going to go RGB. We want a pure red. And you can already see what it's starting to do. We want this green, and the last one, we want blue. And there you have it. And it's kind of like this interesting, weird object, multicolored object that now is able to, you know, you can kind of really dictate. Uh, if you didn't like that one, maybe you play with the seed value and find one that you really like because you really wanted red near the camera instead of blue. Um, yeah, so that's, that's kind of like how we were like creating this, um, this setup to then you know, work with all of those different takes and bring that into compositing and, uh, and combine that to, to kind of create that look. And so that's kind of just one element of that shot. But it's kind of like something that, you know, again, that kind of really only worked if I can go back to not somebody else's montage. If I can go back to this. I'm falling on my last life. Uh, and we go towards this end section. You can kind of see like how the different colors are being treated throughout, how some of them are, have this halftone effect, and how we're able to kind of, especially once we get into here, if I can pause this, you can see that you know, those line passes are, are being brought on top of everything. The characters have this grit layer that is being you know, kind of screened on top and matted to just them, not the environment. And we're able to kind of go in and, and color you know, different segments of this environment. And you can see how there's reflections, like all of this is reflective. You can see like the speed lines. So kind of, although it looks like this kind of uh, cacophony of like chaos, it, it actually is like, you know, very formulaic, formulaic in what we were trying to do and how we were trying to accomplish that. But really it was just a matter of like figuring out how to make sure we could dial all that in and uh, make it live within this kind of multiverse. Um, yeah. And, if I jump back, and oh, so here's kind of like what a uh, compositing breakdown of that. So as I was kind of showing you what those render passes were doing, this is what a qu kind of quick time of what all of those look like rendered, and then kind of, uh, and then in a second, 
is going to show you what all of those look like as we were combining it inside of comps or using RGB passes to bring it into you know, specific faces and specific areas and you know, bringing in the, the character reflections to where we want, using Z-depth to kind of give some fall off as it moves away from camera, and then using a little bit of a sketch and tune there uh, to give the characters, like the, again, like going back to those design frames where we were kind of giving them those rough edges <laughs> by using the uh, sketch and tune, we're able to kind of give that like a uh, rough quality to our, to our characters. And you know, it wasn't something that we wanted to use over the top because it's something that you can kind of notice immediately and you just didn't want it to look like a stock effect. But you definitely wanted, it definitely is a part of that comic book vernacular. So it was something that we, we wanted to include. And then you can kind of see the character offsetting where inside of, uh, you know, cinema where we were taking those different color passes and just kind of slightly offsetting them. So there was a little bit of misregistration so that everything didn't feel perfect. And it kind of uh, felt back to this kind of more tangible quality that we were looking for in our sequence. Um, and then with that, I'll just kind of play, oop, I won't play this. I will uh, play the rest of that title sequence that I cut off so you can see that. Through the night time when the light shine, I go python. I'm falling on my last lifeline. There's no way in my right mind. My city up on my back tight. How can I possibly act right? I'm Robin Hood, I'm the black knight. I know you heard about my last fight. Cause I win over and over again. Battling evil, I'm hoping to win. Fighting my demons, I'm nice for a reason. The with the bleeding, I'm showing my sins. How can you expect me to stay sane? Protect me. My techniques don't expedite on highways and jets. To be hanging around, nobody trying to figure out if they good or evil. I'm fighting the crime, send me your lies one at a time. I'm killing the rhymes, I do it for the people. I'm Peter Parker running through the six with a bag full of tricks. My boy, you better choose a side. I may have lost the battle, but I will not lose the war. I can promise you I will not lose this time. I did it all independent, no really all independent. Now we winning. I got my homies cooking up in the kitchen. In the kitchen so we gon' have to win it, come for some The world is mine, and you gon' have to pay me attention. And I did everything that I did on my own. I'm a one-on-one -on -one for real, that can never be a clone. Better talk to me nice, better watch your tone. And I'm putting on for my home song, so I gotta go hard. And then continuing my tradition of showing things that didn't make the cut, that is not the final logo, as you can see. That was one that I made that did not make the final. But uh, again, it's all a process and working on design iterations and working through the end. So you can kind of see, like, again, we were using the standard render. It wasn't nothing fancy. And it was just, it's not really about, you know, not, not everything needs to be fancy. Sometimes you can use the most basic things to create something that's, like, super stylized and, uh, you know, experimental. And again, it kind of goes back to those days at MK12 of like doing all that kind of self-driven and experimental work, which kind of helped me get to this point of being able to be thrown into a project like this and, and at the end of the day, come out with something that I'm really happy with that our team did. Everyone worked really hard on it. And um, if you have the chance to watch it in stereo, we actually did a true stereo. Like I said, we did everything in, in the left and right eye. All the textures and everything was like another creative challenge to make sure that that all worked at the right depth so that as you're watching a theater, something didn't feel like it was like going to make you sick. Uh, so if you do get the chance, it is, it is a treat in 3D as well as the 2D version. Um, but with that, I will end and say you can find me at friedpixels.com. I'm also on social media at friedpixels at both. And um, yeah, hit me up. Thank you. <laughs>